Welcome everyone to Evolving Together with Christine Labbe, Beyond the Diagnosis into a New Realm of Possibilities. Your child deserves to be seen, heard, valued, and celebrated exactly as they are. Hi, I'm Christine, founder of Evolve Movement, a pediatric neuromovement practitioner, conscious parenting coach, and author of Our Superpowers, celebrating differently abled kids and their siblings. I offer new insights, understanding, and expansion that empower you to support your child in a way that is aligned with their soul's potential. You are not limited to the stories you've been taught to believe. You can write your own narrative. It takes 28% of parents with a neurodiverse child to awaken and advocate for change to start seeing progress. Be the change you want to see and take the first step towards a new future. Evolving Together starts now. Welcome to Evolving Together, where we delve into the possibilities beyond your child's diagnosis. I'm your host, Christine Labbe, and I am thrilled to have you join us today for a deeply insightful and powerful conversation. Today's episode is one that I believe will resonate with so many of you, especially those navigating the challenges of raising boys in today's world. Our guest is none other than Tasha Shore, a renowned parent coach, author, and fierce advocate for boys. Tasha is on a mission to create a more peaceful world, one sweet boy at a time, by helping parents raise emotionally intelligent and connected sons. Tasha brings her wealth of experience and knowledge to our discussion today, drawing from her book, Listen, Five Simple Tools to Meet Your Everyday Parenting Challenges, and her years of work with families around the globe. We'll be diving into some of the most pressing issues parents face, including how to address aggression in boys, the importance of creating a loving and supportive environment, and how we as parents can manage our own emotions to better support our children. We'll explore Tasha's personal journey and uncover the transformative power that comes from separating a child's essence from their behavior. If you've ever felt overwhelmed by your child's aggression or wondered how to help them navigate big feelings, this episode is for you. So without further ado, let's dive into this heartfelt and empowering conversation with Tasha Shore. Hello and welcome to Evolving Together. Today we're so excited to have Tasha Shore as our guest for today's interview. Tasha, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. So why don't we begin by talking a little bit about how you started this work? Wow, okay. Well, um, we'll start with my personal story because that's truly how I got to where I am. So I, I grew up pretty much with my mom, she and I being a dynamic duo in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area in California in the you know 70s, 80s. And it was a real time of women's empowerment. And so we were very much involved in protests and fighting for women's rights and all the things and it was quite empowering and girl power and I can be whatever I want and all of that and it was fantastic and I went to college I was a women's studies major uh, fast forward and I got pregnant I was married I got pregnant and one morning I had a thought and that thought was oh my God, what if I have a boy? And what do you do when you have that thought when you grow up the way I do? You call your mom. So I called my mom and I was like, mom, what if I have a boy? And there was just silence on the other end of the line. And then she goes, we'll figure it out. Don't worry, we'll figure it out. And it was like to think back on that, first of all, like what kind of a mindset do I have to be in to even have that thought in the first place, right? So there was something, let's just call it interesting going on there. Um, and then, you know, fast forward, I had one boy, two boys, three boys, and I ended up being in a parenting situation where I loved these beings more than anything ever on the planet or off the planet. I 
couldn't even describe the depth of my love for these beings. And yet in the paradigm that I grew up in, they were the bad guys, right? They were the boys, the men, the bad guys. And to complicate things a little bit more, they sometimes struggled uh, and showed behaviors that the world definitely didn't like, labeled bad, bully, mean, uh, class clown, sort of all the things. I felt ashamed and embarrassed and I was sort of in this place of, well, what do I do? I love these beings. The behavior is not okay, but it's also not okay that the world is just writing them off because of them. Like if they can't make a mistake when they're three, four or five, like how are they ever going to learn? And so it became really clear to me that I needed to connect the dots for parents um, and particular, in particular for parents of young boys that we have this amazing opportunity to raise emotionally intelligent men to help the world understand that part of being a feminist and fighting for women's rights is fighting for everybody's rights and that it's not doing anybody any good for us to marginalize this group and basically just write them off. We're all suffering because of it. And so I've just made it sort of my feminist mission to fight for for boys and, and ultimately for their right to feel. You know what, that's such an important mission that you have, because we do need to see change in this area. Yeah. So why don't we start with perhaps talking about, because I know you talk a lot about creating an environment, a loving environment for boys to grow up in, so that they can begin to feel, so that they begin to really explore that part of themselves. Can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. I think I think it's really important, like what I just alluded to, that we separate our boys from their behaviors. Now, I think what happens is that I say that and then people get scared and think, oh, well, that we're just going to let them off the hook, right? Then they're not going to be accountable for their behaviors. But that's not what I mean. What I mean is everyone's allowed to make mistakes. We've we, we've we've moved into this world where there are no mistakes allowed. And, and, and then everybody's terrified to move. And we're incredibly divided because we, we, can't, we can't try anything. And we need to avoid that. So as a parent, if you've got a kid who's struggling, I think the most important thing is to let him know, hey, I see you. I love you. I see things are hard. I'm not going to leave, write you off, punish you, shame you because I don't like your behavior or your behavior isn't appropriate or, you know, bad for lack of a better word. I'm going to help you through this because only from a place of feeling like he's seen, will he be able to change? That's true for all of us, right? If, if we just think about a time, any of us, any of you listeners, you think about a time when uh, somebody close to you was wishing you were different, trying to get you to change in some way. It generally doesn't work. Like the, the, the way that we encourage people to change, I don't say get people to change, but the way that we encourage people to change, um, because sometimes we do see that it would be better off for them is by accepting them right where they are and loving them right where they are. Like for, as an adult, it might be, let's say you have a partner who struggles with um, you know, alcohol abuse or something like that. It's like, you can't just say, you know, you really should stop drinking. I don't like it. I mean, you can say those things, but the likelihood that that's going to change the behavior is not very high. There's, there's uh, a piece of acceptance, like you are good in your, your essence is good. Your soul is good. And I love you. And I see you despite all this mess going on around you. And we're going to get through it. So there's a, there's a bit about this messaging, I think, that creates that environment that you're talking about. I love what you're saying about not trying to change the individual and really accepting them exactly as they are. You know, you speak a lot about this understanding, really creating space to understand them, to know where they're coming from. And, you know, this is so very important for children that face a neurodiversity or have some type of any type of diagnosis or complex health needs. And sometimes, you know, we see that many of them are quite sensitive. You know, I find that a lot of them are extra sensitive 
even even more so than the average child. And so we do see a lot of behavioral issues. We do see a lot of aggression. So I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit for these parents that are listening to this interview. Absolutely. So I, I work with all kinds of families. Um, I'm not trained in working with neurodiverse families, but I had a client recently who said to me, why don't you talk more about that? And I said, well, because like, it's not really my background. She's like, but but you're the one who helps us. You're the one who helps us. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> it, was, it was very sweet. She's like, you, you know, you're just, you're so non-judgmental. You don't, you don't try to, you're not dogmatic. You're not trying to get us to do X, Y, or Z. You just accept us. Just what we talked about. You just accept us right where we are. There's no shame. You let us experiment. You support us. So, um, but yeah, so I, I think the extra sensitive is interesting. So a lot of families that I work with, um, do have diagnoses, but a lot of them don't. Um, not necessarily because their child wouldn't be diagnosed if they chose to diagnose, they just choose not to. Um, and then there are neurotypical kids too. But what I find is that everybody needs that base of connection. And every child needs to know essentially from their parent that they are loved and that we're going to keep them safe. And so with aggression, the safety piece, like we really do have to take seriously. The thing is, is like when parents have kids who are struggling with, struggling with aggression, we tend to come down hard because we get scared. Um, and we start with kind of harsher limits. And it doesn't work because we push the child away. We end up sort of at war with them rather than on the same page. So when I'm coaching parents through aggression, we always start from a place of what I call kind of getting yourself set up for success. Like how do you set yourself up for success? And that might be um, uh, paying attention to your triggers, right? And, and noticing there's a certain type of behavior that particularly bothers you, or there's a certain time of day, or um, when you're stressed about work or whatever it is. But just, just notice that there are things that you need to pay attention to, or you might um, think about if there's something in the environment that needs changing in the same way that let's say you wanted to lose weight and your, your freezer was, you know, stocked with Ben and Jerry's or whatever. Part of creating a more conducive environment to making the change would be to get rid of that ice cream and stop buying it. So in the same way, like, is, do you need to have a conversation with your partner? Uh, if there's aggression going on, do you need to put those padded things on the corners of tables or perhaps move sharp objects out of the room or breakable objects so that you're not worried your child's going to take and throw something that's near and dear to you and break it. So what needs to happen in the environment? So, so we start there and then we move into that connection piece, because like I said, we can't, we can't help them with when they don't feel connected and they don't feel seen and loved. Um, I think there's also a bit about doing our own healing. You know, I mentioned fear, and that's one of the biggest obstacles I see that parents have when they're trying to help a child through aggression is that we get scared. We, and often rightly so. Kids are hitting, kicking, spitting, screaming, throwing things, breaking things. It can be scary. But again, the only way that that child is going to be able to calm is to be able to co-regulate with our nervous system. So if we are scared and we're flipping out, we're going to we're going to take the road that they're on rather than calming and allowing them to come towards the road that we've chosen to take. So we have to do our own healing as well. You don't have to like figure it all out or heal all of your trauma before you can parent, but you absolutely need to be on that road in concert with the limit setting, with all the other things that we do with aggression. No, oh, absolutely. So, I mean, you speak of triggers, right? And that's, that's a lot of what comes up. So it's definitely correlated with creating that safe space, creating that environment for the child to start to calm down. So what would you suggest, where do you get a parent to start? You talked about the environment physically itself, but then how do you start walking that parent down? You know, I know, I know it's each individual, it's going to be different, but do you have any particular steps that you kind of walk parents down to help them begin to walk down that path? The path of their own healing or the path to ending the aggression? 
Well, I feel like they're kind of intertwined. So perhaps you can just answer in the ways that that feels best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, let me just dive a little bit more into our own healing and the fear. So what I've seen over the years is that particularly for women, though not only for women, um, most women, unfortunately, um, and many men as well, but most women have had some sort of a an experience with a male uh, that was violent in, in some way, whether that was, you know, they were the victim of physical violence or sexual violence or whatnot. And, and I see often parents getting really triggered by their very small child and his aggressive behaviors because they are having a flashback to the boyfriend in college, for example. And there, so, there, so there's work to be done and, and which modality people choose, there, there are many. I personally am a huge proponent of listening partnerships, which I'm not sure you're familiar with or not, but we there's a chapter in our book on listening partnerships. And essentially it is a exchange of listening between two consenting adults where one adult um, is allowed to, to vent and, and share whether that be with words or it's actually quite the point is uh, it's a somatic healing experience so we're looking for you know sweating and shaking and laughing and crying and tantruming like all all that's fair game it's like whatever comes out and the other person who's listening their job is really to like we talked about earlier accepting that person exactly where they are pouring their love in, their trust in that that person is going to figure it out. So it's not about, oh, I have a good idea. You know, when I had that situation, I did X, Y, or Z. There, there's this bit, um, excuse me, that's really important about trusting in mm -hmm. that person's ability to find their way. And it can be hard at first because, especially if you've experienced something similar, but as you practice this more and more, it's quite empowering because and it's, it's exciting because you see that people find their way. Um, one, they take off in a different path than we would have suggested. And two, they often end up in a different place with a different solution than we would have suggested. And we're like, wow. So it's kind of awe inspiring the practice. Um, it can be uncomfortable for people at first because we're not used to it, um, but, but it's very, very healing. So that's one modality. It's a modality that I used. I've used it to move out of a 10 month depression. I've used it to move through trauma. I just had, as you know, a very traumatic you know, experience being the victim of a violent crime. I am using that modality to recover and it is making a huge difference. Um, one, because I know there are people who can support me and so I don't feel alone. And two, because the act of actually allowing space and creating time for, to, you know, to cry and to tremble and to allow the fear to be released is freeing me up to be able to think better and make better choices. So that's one modality, but some people have used therapy. I mean, you do healing modalities with people, right? So there's not one right way, but you want to find something that works for you. And, and what I would say is like, if what you're doing isn't working, like if, if you are as triggered as you were six months ago by your child's behavior and you have been using a particular modality, I would love for you to let go of that and to try something different or perhaps get a coach or, 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 or a, a, a mentor who could tweak the practice that you're doing like maybe there's just something that you're not quite getting but don't just keep doing something that's not working because it's going to be five years before you know it and nothing's going to change and that is an important piece you know what i love what you're saying right now because it actually gives the parent when you're telling me this i'm thinking it actually gives the parent an opportunity one to hold the space for another person in that space of silence and quiet and holding the space but also being the person that's being held yes and it's such a beautiful experience to feel both because i feel it's so empowering then for the parent to really create that for the child that is Absolutely. going to be a tantrum right which i assume is 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 part of it all yeah i mean it's so cool it's one of the most it's surprising things that people discover when they start the practice listening partnerships so uh, uh, yes, you go in and you think, okay, I've got all these triggers, like I need to do my healing, but you come out empowered. And it's so cool because when we're in these places where our kid is 
at, struggling with aggression, for example, and we're perhaps walking around with feelings like we're a failure, or what do we do to cause this, or what, you know, it's our fault or guilt or whatever it is, um, it can be really disempowering, right? We can feel helpless and hopeless. And, and just like you said, having this practice that we go into perhaps for our own healing, but we actually come out feeling more empowered because we realize, oh, even in our, let's say, compromised state, our challenged state emotionally, we are able to help somebody else. And that lifts our confidence. And I always talk to parents about getting yourself into good enough parenting shape. You don't have to be perfect, but you have to have enough confidence to be able to think clearly and implement tools. So that, that that's a bit about like, the, he the healing bit. In terms of the aggression overall, we talked about um, setting yourself up for success. We talked a little bit about um, uh, connecting. We didn't talk in detail about it, but essentially, uh, I'm trying to think if there's something else that I want to add. We didn't talk about specific practices. I don't know if you want to talk about specific practices, but essentially, whatever works for you, uh, your child his brain needs to feel seen and feel felt by you. So I like to say to parents, think about a time or like think about the things that you do together where you laugh or you feel particularly connected to one another. And it might be the cuddly reading time before bed. It might be pillow fights and you're laughing. It might be, um, you know, okay, walking the dog together, but jumping on the trampoline. I don't know. It could be a million different things, but what, how do you laugh together? How do you really enjoy each other? Just sort of brainstorm a list and just start doing more of that stuff. Because when I when families come to me, generally the, the let's just say, number of negative interactions per day far outweighs the positive ones. Part of that is perception. So you want to pay attention because there's more positive going on than you, could, than you are likely noticing. But really we want to shift the balance so that there are many more positive interactions per day and the aggression is the occasional blip so we're looking to to, to switch that um so so the next thing that i do is really getting into like the nitty-gritty of the setting loving limits and then using play strategically and i think i mean maybe i'll just start with play by saying that you don't have to be afraid of play it is not your biggest fear that if you move in playfully with an aggressive child, that it will encourage that child to act more aggressively is not true. That's not how the brain works and it's not what happens. So if you're holding back from play because of that worry, just let it go and try it. I forget who it was, but somebody said like laughter is the shortest distance between two people. So just think of the last time that you had like a huge belly laugh with somebody. You you can't help but feel close to them after that, right? There's just like this physiological connection between you of like sweetness. And so lead into play. With aggression, I will say that I, I generally, talk, generally talk about like the train leaving the station, right? So many of us, we get that feeling in our stomach like, oh God, you know, here we go. Once the train leaves the station and the child is already, you know, hitting, spitting, scratching, biting, kicking, all that stuff, play isn't going to be your friend at that point, probably. Pause, right? T.O., pause. You know your kid better than me, or I don't even know your kid, but better than anybody else. So if you, if you feel like play might be useful at that point, you got nothing to lose by trying. But in my two decades of doing this work, what I've noticed is it doesn't generally work so well once you're sort of in the heat of the aggression. But there's so much you can do with it proactively. So just integrating more physical rough and tumble play, roughhousing into your daily life um, is, is a great thing that helps aggression. Big play before bed, people tend to think wind down, wind down, wind down. But if your child struggles with like waking in the night, wetting the bed, those types of things, big play before bed makes a huge difference. Um, so so not, not to be afraid of it. Um, and then I feel like there's something else that I was going to say. Oh, so that's sort of the proactive piece. But then you also can be really responsive with play at first before the train leaves the station. So 
maybe I'm gonna think of an example. Um, maybe your child grabs something from the plate of their sibling at dinner and you go like, you get that feeling in your stomach and you're like, oh God, here we go. We're about to, I, I know how this is gonna play out, right? We're about to have World War III here. At that point, can you get playful? Right? Can you use what we call, we read about in the book, the vigorous snuggle, where you just, you know, come in with your kind of gleam in your eyes and say, like, do you know what happens to little boys who grab things off their brother's plate? And then you offer some silly thing, you know, they get chased around the house or they get their elbows licked or, you know, just something goofy. You're going for laughter. Mm. And I think this is really important. Your target is connection. Your target isn't how do I get the thing that he took off the plate back on the plate. That's the secondary result. The you know the 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 reconciliation between the siblings is the fallout. It's it's the well fallout's not the right word, but is 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 the what's the right word? Like a, it's what happens as a result of, of of the connection. But first and foremost, that kid needs to feel like you see him, you you get him, you've got him. You're going to take responsibility for keeping everyone safe. And laughter is a great way to do that. So in that situation, maybe you go and try to lick his elbow and it's silly. And then he gets up and starts running around and you chase him around. And maybe you're thinking, okay, but it's dinner, Tasha. Like, I don't want to be chasing my kid around the house. I get it. But you know what? You've got a kid who's struggling. If you had an easy kid, you wouldn't be listening to this in the first place. And so we we have to experiment and, and we're going to have to move out of our comfort zones. But what I will say is your results are going to be astonishing. Like you will see change and you'll see change pretty quickly. And that will inspire you to continue to keep yourself in good enough parenting shape to continue to parent this way as his behaviors shift over time. You know, I love the idea of play because it brings out that playful side within everyone in the family. Yes. It things so much and it does lead to that connection and it helps the parent shift their own energy into a playful state so that they're not in reaction mode or triggered mode or they're just shifting their energy into okay I'm going to come in playful right, That's right. so I, I do feel that makes a huge difference and I'm sure I mean children behave in certain ways for a particular reason, right? There's always a reason behind the behavior. Maybe you can speak to that a little bit because I, I suppose the playful side, you know, helps kind of find first, it's it's almost like this in-between period where you're trying to figure out, okay, why is he behaving that way? And then kind of trying different ways to see how he's going to respond. Am I am I right? Yeah, well, well one, well, before I to respond to that, one thing I want I want to add about the play that's really cool is that you can do it with multiple kids. So most of us who have kids who struggle tend have tend to have one kid who struggles most, and oftentimes that kid, that kid is taking up most of the airtime in the family. And parents come and they feel like the whole family is revolving around this child. And one of the great things about play is that even like the kid who's got the stuff snagged from their plate they get to be a part of this we get to all do it together so it's something that's positive that can include everybody that brings people together rather than you know you going off with one child who's struggling in general what i've discovered is that aggression is almost always fear in disguise and fear can be a lot of different things right it can be a real fear like there's a dog barking at me and I'm scared that it's going to come bite me, right? Or it can be a, um, it can be like a perceived fear that maybe is stored trauma, right? So it, it, it could be a lot of different things, the fear. But if I'm, let's just say I figure it out. Let's just say I have a kid who every time he hears a dog bark, he starts biting his me or whatever. So I could think back and go like, oh, you know, we were on a walk once and he got bit by a dog when he was little and ever since he's been scared. Okay, so I know the why. Well, all right, great. 
So, I mean, I guess one option would be to try to avoid dogs for the rest of this child's life. Mm. Maybe that's possible, but ultimately probably they're going to come across dogs and we're going to have to help him build his tolerance. Right. So that's when we move into limit setting. And again, like I can be more controversial than perhaps other coaches. Uh, I'm not somebody, I, I'm somebody who believes that I, my goal is to help my child live his biggest, bestest life. And I don't want fear to hold him back. So there are some things that cause aggression, some fears that um, uh, there, I, can't, I can't do anything about, right? And, and there's some that, and, and then there are genuine fears that are, that are, and that make sense to be scared of. But there are some that are just holding the child back. So like, for example, when one of my kids was little, um, and I know a lot of parents experience things like this, he was begging me to go to like a circus class. He wanted to take this circus, you know, thing where you flip all over the place. And, and he was super excited about it. Did you sign me up? Did you sign me up? He was little. I don't know how old he was, five, six, seven, something like that. Okay. Yeah. So then the day comes and it's time to go. And he's just like, I don't want to go. You didn't even ask me if I wanted to go. And he's all upset and having a huge tantrum about it. Right. And so it took me making a decision in that moment. So one decision would be, okay, he's having a huge tantrum and he's kicking me. And like, I could take that trigger away and I could say, all right, we won't go. You don't need to go. Like there's, you know, you could live a life without circus and be totally fine. That would be one option. I don't like that option. I'm fine with, I don't, I'm not interested in circus. I went a few times. I don't like it. It's not my thing. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm fine with that. But to make a decision to stop because he's obviously scared to go, I want to help my kid through that. And so the way that looked, and this is sort of an example of what setting loving limits could look like, is that I already had experience with this child. And so I had planned to have plenty of time to get to that class. I did what we call stay listening. There's a chapter on that in our book, Listen, as well. And I basically held a loving limit and I said, we're, we're going to go to circus, sweet boy. We're going to go. And he was just, no, you can't make me go. You know, the big tantrum. I blocked. I kept myself safe, right? It went on and on. I don't remember how long it took anymore, but let's say 20 minutes. I don't know. And then it was like, fine, I'll get in the car, but I'm not going. We got in the car. We drove to the circus class. I'm not getting out in the car. You know, you can't make me get out of the car. You're going to get out of the car, sweet boy. We're going to go to circus. I don't want to go to circus. Blah. Huge tantrum, upset, whatever. I listened. He got out of the car, but I'm not going in, right? So you get it. So it's like this little step and this little step and this little step. So fast forward, we went in, we sat on the side, we watched. By the end of the class, I think it was probably the last five minutes. I can't remember. He actually went out. Okay, he did it. He loved it. The next time we went, he went right in. And I think to myself, if I had allowed that fear to scare me, he would have missed out on this experience that he ultimately ended up loving for the rest of the however many weeks of the class. So we have to ask ourselves as parents, like not just is this thing worth fighting for, you know, from our perspective of like how important is like something like circus, which isn't really important for most of us, right? but it's not really about that, you know, versus like, do I want to show my child that he can do hard things, that that fear is just a feeling and that I'm not scared of it. And I'm also not scared of the big feelings that come up in you as a result of the fear. When you come at me with a fist, that doesn't scare me. I continue to see your goodness. I will block. I will not let you hurt me. 
but I'm not going to lose sight of your goodness. And I'm not going to lose sight of your ability to go enjoy yourself in that class that you begged me for weeks to sign you up for. I'm not saying those things to him, but that's the mindset that I have when I'm blocking the hits and lovingly saying, we're going to go to circus, sweet boy, and allowing him to have his feelings because I get to hold the limits, but I don't get to decide how he feels about those limits. I just get to be present and hold that space for him and show him over and over again that feelings are like clouds. Right? They all eventually pass. It will pass. And then you will have increased ability to think well and make better decisions. Like, yeah, I like circus, but I don't think I want to do it like every day or I just want to do it once a week or I liked it, but I think I want to try something else now. That's a very different decision. That's a decision as opposed to a, you know, tantrum and huge upset that's, you know, sweaty, shaky, fear rolling off him. I'm not going. It's a very different scenario. You know, I think it's wonderful because you're creating a space where you're allowing him to feel, right? Yeah. I mean, you're teaching him, no, feeling is good. We want you to feel. I want you to feel this. And now I'm going to empower you so that you don't allow these feelings to limit you in life, right? That you move through them. I mean, you're teaching him so much just in this example, right? And Absolutely. It, really, it takes an empowered parent to be able to create that space to empower the child and to feel comfortable with feeling the feelings. You know, a lot of that means the parent has to do that work too, is to be comfortable with feeling the feelings and understanding that feeling the feelings is important, that it has to happen, that it's okay, you know, and that it's okay for a child to have big feelings. Right. It's not only okay, it's imperative. Exactly. It's imperative. It, it, we can't, walk around like a bunch of pressure cookers trying to hold everything in, which is essentially, if you look at the world, what is going on, right? And especially for our young boys, we talked about at the beginning, like needing to preserve their ability to feel because most boys by a very young age, I don't remember the study, five, four, something like that. All they've got is I can be happy or I can be angry. That's very limiting. And it's also terrifying for the rest of us mm -hmm. if that's all they've got. So if we want to, like I do and my business mission, to create a more peaceful world one sweet boy at a time, like that's going to happen by creating space for them to feel. We in general, I mean, gender neutral, it's like we have mislabeled feelings and big feelings as the problem. The feelings aren't the problem. Sometimes people act on feelings in ways that are definitely problematic, but the feelings themselves aren't the problem. The problem already happened, like for our child, like the hurt already set in or the slight already happened or whatever scared them, the dog already barked at them or whatever it is. We can't make that go away. We can't take it back. Like the bad already happened. So to mislabel the feelings as the problem is stunting the emotional growth of our children. Mm -hmm. We need to realize that the release of those feelings is their path to freedom, right? I was just the victim of this crime. If all I'm doing is holding those feelings inside, then all, I'm, all that's going to happen to me is every time I see people who look like those people or every time I get out of my car, I'm going to be like terrified looking over my shoulder. I mean, that's a problem. All I'm going to be is doing is reacting for the rest of my life. But if I can schedule listening time and do listening partnerships, which is ultimately stay listening for us adults, then I'm doing my healing and I can get back to a place of thinking, okay, well, is there perhaps a neighborhood that I don't want to be at at a certain time of night? Or is there, um, you know, maybe I don't want to empty my car of my luggage from my airport outside of the garage. Maybe I want to pull into the garage. Like I can make smart choices, but I don't have to walk around terrified and reactive I can be thinking and proactive and we regain our ability to think and we increase our intelligence by releasing the feelings. They are not the problem. And that is true of our kids too. So if you have a kid who is hitting and biting and kicking and doing all these things, 
they need to be able to release that tension. If you've already sort of scanned the scene and you've already, um, you know, removed the external stressors that are, you know, that are piling too much intensity on this child, and this is still happening, then we need to create space for the healing. So I love everything you're saying. And, you know, coming back to the releasing of all of those feelings, releasing that excess energy, all of that, you know, there's a lot of children, I would say most of the children that come in my practice are highly sensitive kids. And so they're often carrying so much energy within them. They're yeah. carrying, they're sensitive to other people's feelings. So they're carrying their own feelings. They're carrying other people's feelings. Right. And they often have behavioral challenges. They ha often have tantrums. And I often tell the parents, there has to be a healthy way to release that energy proactively, as you say. And so I wondered if you could speak to that, if you have any suggestions for parents to be able to proactively help their kids release a lot of that stuff, not only when it's happening, but also proactively so that they can move that energy. So I'll tell you something. What I've seen is that Oftentimes parents come to me and they learn these tools. They learn like about stay listening, for example. And then they start doing this thing where they're like, well, I can see he really needs to release. So I'm sort of creating this setup. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And I don't like it. I'll tell it just all, all I have to do is think about somebody doing that to me. And like my level of fury, like goes through the roof. It's like, you don't get to decide when I do my healing. I get to decide when I do my healing. Now I have a fully developed brain as do you. So I can, you know, schedule a listening partnership or a meeting with a therapist or a somatic healing session or whatever it is. But for our kids, no, we're that person. So let's say they're holding it together at school, but falling apart when they get home, that's a win. And all we have to do is be ready, keep ourselves in good enough parenting shape so that we can be responsive and hold space for those feelings when they come out. I feel like when we try to do the setup, be like proactive, the kids push back. They don't like it. And I get that same visceral feeling, so I get it. Um, I mean, I'm curious, this is my experience with the tools that I use, and I'm absolutely open and respectful of the fact that you might have a different different experience, but that would be my response to that. You know what, I love it, because I think it's important that there are different responses, because there are different children, right? Yes. Some of the kids that I see in my practice, I think children that have are on the autism spectrum, they run a lot of energy in their body in general. And yeah. so sometimes I'll feel in their body because my work is somatic. And so I'll feel, you know, twitches and there's there's just so much going on even within the body that I can feel. There's so much tension in the body. And so I know there's this excess amount of energy that's running through them. And sometimes they'll be explosive in certain moments and it's just so unpredictable. You know, it just kind of happens. And I've noticed that with some children when they're, you know, dancing or they're doing things in the home to kind of move a little bit of that energy is actually quite helpful or different things that um, can calm the nervous system is really helpful, you know, for a lot of these children that I work with, but children on the autism spectrum are already different in many ways. Um, and so some things that might work for them may not work for another child. You know, there, there's, there are other children that come in who have conditions like cerebral palsy that are also extra sensitive, have been through so much trauma. And so there's a lot of feelings and a lot that has been unprocessed right yes. which is which is really what kind of lingers and so i can totally understand that creating space to release energy for that child perhaps wouldn't work right because when he does have a tantrum they're just these huge moments and they're usually related to lack of sleep or they might be related to too much stimulation or too much activity and perhaps maybe it's looking at that in terms of being proactive and saying okay maybe there was too much going on that day. Maybe we were in too many public spaces for that child that day. I don't know if you have anything to say because you're the expert. You know, I, I would love well, to hear 
have to say. I mean, um, I, I, I guess what I would say is I look at that as an opportunity, right? Again, we're so programmed to think that these upsets are bad and the problem. They're not. Right. They really are not. Um, it is problematic if we're getting hurt, if things are getting broken, that kind of a thing, which is why limits are, are you know, setting the safety limits are, are important. Um, I don't mean like setting a safety limit, like don't, you know, don't break the vase. I mean, like, let's proactively move that out of the room and, you know, block if we need to kind of a thing. Um, but kids know how to heal. Their bodies know how to heal. If we are attentive and responsive and attend to our own emotional healing such that we can be calm in the face of their challenges, they will heal. We're the harder cases, right? Because we've been told to, you know, zip it and quiet and, you know, buck up and man up and keep it together and be brave and all those things for, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. We have to relearn how to release those feelings in a healing way with loving attention. But our kids, they know that. Like that child you just described, he is seizing the moment. Here he is with somebody who he knows loves him more than anybody on the planet and will not leave. Will keep him safe and protect him no matter what. And so his body's like, all right, let's go. Here's an op. Because I just have been at you know school all day or at my homeschool class or whatever and it took everything i have to try to you know stay focused for the half an hour or six hours or whatever it was so again for me it's really a perspective shift mm -hmm. you know I, I love everything you're saying and i completely agree the parents play a huge role because as parents, we do teach our children how to regulate by regulating our own nervous system. And I, I totally, totally agree with you. Um, to be able to stay calm, to, to find your peaceful inner space yeah. when your child is having a meltdown is the most important thing, right? You want to be that safe space. You want it to be felt that you are that safe space, that you love them unconditionally that you understand that they have big feelings and you're gonna hold that space for them. And for parents, that means they have to learn how to do that for themselves, right? To understand themselves, to have that compassion for themselves, to hold space for their own feelings, to begin to love themselves unconditionally. You know, I, I find the parents start to see their children through this specific particular lens. And it's really important to break that down right yeah. if you want to speak to that a little bit well to me that's why listening partnerships are so important because you know as feeling uh, sorry as parents of of kids who struggle with aggression and the and with these hard behaviors it is normal for us to have all kinds of feelings and it's normal for us to have all kinds of feelings that we might feel ashamed to say to a friend at a coffee shop right things like I hate my kid because I've never met a parent who at some point didn't have that feeling. It's just a feeling, right? I hate this kid or what did I do to deserve this life or this kid or this kid is making my life miserable or I wish I didn't have this kid or, uh, you know, I mean, all of these things, which like people, oh my God, like I can't, I can't say that or people are going to think I'm a horrible person or whatnot. But the reality is, is we have all, been pushed to our limit. And we are all under resource, right? Parenting is not supported by society. Parenting is like, you know, hey, let's do this on the side while we have a full time job and with no support. I mean, you're in Canada, you have a bit more support than we do here in the States. But like, generally, in most societies, definitely in Western societies where we don't have like, you know, sort of big extended families and, 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 and communities to help with child rearing, we're pretty much on our own. And it's too big of a job. It's not a one person or a two person job. And so, and our social systems also, I mean, in the States, like there's no child care. What do you do till your kid's five and can go to school? For five years, you have to choose between working and supporting your family. I mean, 
there are a lot of problems that aren't our fault and we take them on. Um, we need to let those feelings out. And so a listening partnership, one thing that I didn't mention about it is that it's 100% confidential. And, and it's a really important point to make because, you know, if I'm having a listening partnership with you, Christine, and I share these feelings with you, you know, I, I can't stand this kid. He's blah, blah, blah. And then I think you're going to tell your partner or my, you know, you know, maybe I occasionally run into you somewhere and you're going to tell someone who knows someone at the preschool or, or, or even that you're just going to be talking about it with someone who I don't know. I then don't have the safety to really do the healing. Mm -hmm. Even if I say it, it's like, I can't really heal because I'm not, I'm protecting myself still. So the confidentiality piece is key because I know that as soon as that timer rings, because let's say we exchange, you know, 10 minutes or half an hour each or whatever it is, I know that I'm zipping that bag closed of all those emotions that I just shared, and they are not coming out of that bag unless I unzip it. And that's amazing. So yes, we have to feel those feelings as parents because otherwise we can't show up. We can't be ready when the storm comes and our kids aren't going to schedule the tantrums with us. They don't get scheduled. We can scan, <laughs> we can scan and we can definitely see patterns mm -hmm. and that's helpful. But still, like if you're hoping and praying and wishing that a behavior will change that's been happening over and over again, right? Like the kids aren't gonna have a huge fight at dinner yet every day they do have a huge fight at dinner. You're not gonna get anywhere, right? We have to take the move, make the move to change our behaviors in order that they change theirs. We can't insist that they do it first. They won't do it. It doesn't work that way. Thank you for mentioning that because a lot of parents come in and they want their child to be fixed and they don't realize that a lot has to do with how they're showing up. You know, that how we show up as parents makes a huge difference in that and that it's really a partnership, right? It's this, yeah, we're working together. And yeah. I find that what you're saying is so powerful because you're sitting listening to someone that is sharing and being in a non-judgmental space. Like, again, this is practice. It's almost while you're sitting with another adult, you're holding the space or you're, sh you're sharing everything right it's either that or you're creating the space that's non-judgmental and simply listening with an open heart in unconditional love you know it's practice for how we're going to be with when we're with our kids is it's not judging their behavior in that moment not judging the tantrum not judging everything that's going on right there's so much power in that exercise it's it's like I think it's wonderful. I think it's really, really amazing to, you know, to and so healing. I mean, it's such a wonderful feeling and it's also self care for the parent. So the parent can choose, oh, you know, this is important for me to take this time. So the parent feels better and yeah. gives them the practice they need to really show up for their kids. I find that amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's truly life altering. I'll never forget. I was working with a dad in Scotland many, many years ago. And I remember him saying, you know, Tasha, this is crazy. Not only has my relationship with my son completely transformed, but my relationship with my wife, he goes, and with my coworkers at work, like I have learned to listen in a completely different way. And it has transformed my life everywhere. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, not to mention the healing that can occur, right? Because it, it, it's through that healing, understanding ourselves, connecting with ourselves on a deeper level. You know, when we move into that deeper space within ourselves, we're able to connect much more deeply with our children, right? Yeah. So it's, we, all, it's all a part of it. Right. And we can't fake it. You know, our kids can read us. They can sense us. And so one of the biggest things with aggression is that we get scared. We have this future fear thing, right? My yes. kids be the next school shooter or the next rapist, or he's going to treat women horribly, or he's going to like bomb a building. I mean, we go, I, I'm, these are things parents say to me, right? He's going to be the bully. If he's like this at five, what's he going to be like at 15? I mean, we are 
we're we're way future worrying and the first thing that i look at with parents is their fear because like we've already mentioned that child can't change as long as we're scared of him and or for him so yeah. we have to first address that right if somebody it's like if if i'm on a flight i hate flying i fly a lot but i'm terrified of it um and i we hit turbulence and i look towards the flight attendant and they are asking somebody they're sort of you know bouncing up and down a little bit and asking somebody if they want sugar in their coffee like I'm borrowing that person's nervous system and calming myself with it, right? But if there's turbulence and I look up and that person is freaking out, that person looks scared, I'm 500 times as scared as I was before because they're supposed to be the ones protecting me. They're supposed to know what's going on and I can tell they don't, right? So it's the same kind of thing with parent. Our kid is looking to us to assure them that we're going to keep them safe. And if they're looking towards us and what they're feeling is, I am terrified for your future, or I am scared of you, that's not going to work. That's the place to start. No, that's amazing. And I actually feel that's a beautiful way to close because that's, that's such a powerful message to take home because that really is where it starts. It really is. So is there anything else you'd like to share with parents to kind of close off this interview today? I do. I want to say that this can be a heavy topic. It, it sounds like a lot. It's hard. I, I know what it's like to have a child who's struggling with aggression, what it means for friendship, community, family, all of the things. And I want you to know that there is so much you can do. Like if you just take one thing, one idea that you gained from listening to us today and experiment with it, you, you will already start to see a shift. So I guess the message that I want to say is like, I truly believe that there is so much hope that your child could absolutely move beyond these behaviors with with your support and that you deserve the support that you need in order to help that child do that yes yes thank you so much thank you for today thank you for your wisdom and we'll see you all next time what an incredible conversation that was i hope you found our discussion as enlightening and empowering as i did Tasha Shore's insights into the world of raising boys, particularly her approach to addressing aggression with love and connection, truly offer a fresh perspective for all parents. Remember, as Tasha so beautifully put it, the behaviors we see in our children aren't the problem. They're often a cry for connection, safety, and understanding. It's our role as parents to guide them through these big feelings not with fear, but with calm, compassionate leadership. I encourage you to take just one of the ideas or strategies we discussed today and experiment with it in your own parenting journey. Small shifts can lead to profound changes and you have the power to create a loving, supportive environment where your child can thrive. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with other parents who might benefit from this conversation. And don't forget to check out Tasha's book, Listen, Five Simple Tools to Meet Your Everyday Parenting Challenges for even more valuable insights. A free gift awaits in the description below. Until next time, keep evolving, keep growing, and remember you and your child are on this journey together. You've been listening to Evolving Together with Christine Labbe, beyond the diagnosis into a new realm of possibilities. Tune in every second Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific Time or 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Transformation Talk Radio for more insights, understanding, and expansion that empower you to support your child in a way that is aligned with their soul's potential. 
Your child deserves to be seen, heard, valued, and celebrated exactly as they are. Are you ready to be the change you want to see for your neurodiverse child? Take the first step towards a new future and visit www.christinelabay.com or check out our collective site, www.evolvemovement.ca.